welcome you all this afternoon, although it seems to be an evening, to, to, to our Investor Day, our relaunch, what I call Silence 2.0, I guess. And I guess my slides are going to be of a slightly lower complexity than our Chief Medical Officer and our Chief Science Officer. And I have obviously been ag agonizing for, for quite a few weeks about the content of this talk, uh, the tone of it, what, what I should try and get across. And in the end, I decided that probably the best way is to start at the very beginning, almost uh, when I passively invested in this company from sort of ground zero and give you a sort of personal journey of how I guess I got enough knowledge up to have the cheek to become the CEO of this company. Uh, and I'm hoping to cater for, 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 for everyone here, uh, you know, as, as complex as the science is, and it, you know, it's, it's a pretty complex subject, let's face it. Uh, I'm hoping that even someone with no starting knowledge can walk away from this presentation with, uh, with, with a good overview of the elegance of RNA interference, RNA therapeutics, and I guess uh, its application in a, in a commercial setting rather than a kind of research in a university setting. And, uh, and that will hopefully translate into hopefully convincing you why Silence Therapeutics is a, is a very important company, if you like, globally. And if I'm just allowed one hard sell, I promise only one hard sell in this presentation. Actually, maybe there's another one a bit later. Um, we are one of a, really a, only a handful of companies in the world with, if you like, the IP position, the technology, and, and really the know-how to make RNA therapeutics a reality. And uh, to, to sort of better define that, what do I mean by a handful? I would estimate that to be 10 credible companies in the world. So I guess what I'm trying to get across is this is not a, a, an everyday situation. Okay, so let's get going on this journey. As you can see, it's a pretty lonely existence there, existence there with a central dogma and silence in the middle. And this was a, a pretty rough day. And, and you know when the idiot's guide to biology, you know, with the yellow covers uh, is getting hard going, that you're in, you're in for a rough ride. But I guess I have to start somewhere in the central dogma is, is as good a place as any. So uh, as a quick side note, I've hired, or hired for one day anyway, this public speaking expert who has expressly forbidden me from any apologies, any conditional statements. Apparently that's a sign of weakness. So I've got to break that rule immediately and immediately apologize to the, to the more knowledgeable members of the audience. I've already caught five people's eyes. It's amazing how you do that. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's pretty basic stuff at the beginning, but just, just hang in there with me, especially if you don't have any knowledge of RNA interference, because I can save you a lot of trouble and a lot of background work. Okay, so again, back to the basic stuff. Think of DNA as the encyclopedia of genes. <coughs> Uh, genes as pieces of code, and these uh, and they're encoded into a, a, an RNA, and then the cell machinery takes over and translates this code, if you like, into a, a protein structure. There. And these are the, the functions of life as we know it. And so, uh, as a way of background, RNA is our uh, the target of our drug. We consider ourselves an RNA therapeutics company, and we have a set of tools which inhibit or interfere with a process of protein production in a disease state. I guess that's hence the term RNA interference. Uh, and, and to give you a bit more color about the landscape, you can now start seeing some more famous companies and interesting companies. They're operating at the protein level. At the left-hand side of the DNA level, we have some up-and-coming gene therapy companies. And there in the middle is, is RNA therapeutics as some of our competitors. And obviously, we're the very best at the top. That's why we're at the top. And. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, that, that there is a common consensus out there that after small molecules and antibodies, RNA therapeutics will become a major class of therapeutics. Okay, so the central dogma is going to be a, a common theme, and just bear with me. Hopefully, it'll get more, more interesting and more complicated. But to take that zooming into a sort of cellular view of, of, of again, this DNA RNA protein concept, we have the encyclopedia in the nucleus, a particular gene being transcribed, exported out of the nucleus translated into protein and again the process of life and a very simple diagram of what we call a dysregulation a disease state of a, a, a of a cell where we have a gain of function if you like or an overexpression of these messenger RNAs translating into dysregulation and disease states uh, such as protein overproduction so quite common in uh, diseases such as cancers and this diagram these couple of healthy and disease state diagrams are worth kind of polaroiding in our mind um, but it, it's going to be again a common theme going through and again, just let me set the scene a bit. So it's a good time to introduce the concept of a short interfering RNA. <coughs> and uh, we're back to this disease state again, an overexpression, upregulation of the messenger RNA resulting in, 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 in a disease state. But this time on the right-hand side, you have, our, you have an sRNA and more specifically our synthetic sRNA called ATU-RNAi, which our branding department came up with 
we don't have a branding department, obviously. But um, <clears throat> a couple of things worth noting about this. Uh, uh, there's a degradation process at the beginning, the one, two, three, where, where, where the sRNA enters the cell. There's a binding process with a, with a target gene and a, a degradation process by that cell's internal machinery. And you get this what's called silencing effect and degradation. And hopefully the cell goes back to, a, a, if you like, a normal healthy state. Going back to my yellow cover idiot's guide, I prefer to think of it as we have one side of a zip entry into the cell, other side of the zip in a, in a perfect match. And again, the cell's machinery automatically takes over and silences, if you like, the, the, the production of the messenger RNA. Uh, a, a couple of other interesting facts to also remember, it's only since 2006 when the Nobel Prize for the discovery of RNA interference uh, was made to fire a mellow. So to be in a therapeutic setting in 2013 and you know actually quite a way down the clinical trial process is, is, is a fast adoption of any technology you know really by anyone's standards and so I get, get, guess at this point I started to get a little bit tiny bit more savvy about what's going on and as as usual in life when things get easier they always somehow seem to get a bit harder which moves on to my next slide and and I've got to be a bit careful here because our chief science officer has got I think over 200 pages of slides, no, I'm only joking, 200 pages of slides on, on, on the problems of, of delivering this particular molecule, this short interfering RNA. But just very quickly, to, apart from the high rate of degradation and immune responses, it, it, it transpires that nakedly delivering this short interfering RNA and this, uh, and this zip or binding process is much harder than uh, anyone can imagine. And we've had to go back with our chemists and, uh, and really if you like, invent delivery technologies which allow the entry of this uh, molecule into the cell. And it just a, a, a very quick point on delivery because it it's a, presents a real paradox for us and our industry. I guess on the one hand, we have to also admit that it, it's potentially a liability. We would certainly rather not have delivery systems. We'd much rather do this in a, in a much more simple manner. Obviously, that's not technologically possible. Uh, and I guess drug regulators don't particularly like delivery systems. You know, it makes drugs more complicated and they, they, they like to live in a very simple world. But on the asset side of the equation, uh, delivery is a, a huge barrier entry to our competitors. And uh, as our delivery people will tell you, there's 10 years of pent up frustration and, 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 and invention and, and trials in humans. So we have a, a, a really a huge head start over anyone who's starting in, in this kind of field. And just a very quick description of our, of our uh, delivery technologies. This is our uh, broad uh, delivery technology called Atriplex, uh, delivery that's a uh, branding department at work again, as you can see, with these handy names. Um, and, and, and this is useful in, in, in diseases such as cancers, as in particular where the, the, there's metastasis in, uh, prevalent. <coughs> we have a more, if you like, pinpoint <laughs> accuracy lung delivery called DAC, uh, which is going to be the, uh, the basis of our acute lung injury and, 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 and sepsis drugs, which Mike will, 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 will expand on. And then we have a, a specific liver delivery, which is called um, DPTC. Okay, so we, I've understood the tools now. We're slightly past the idiot's guide and we're, we're on the ground and I've got to kind of try to understand how, how we go about it, it, thinking about what drugs to make, what diseases to target. And it seems that we have a, a, a pretty simple seven point algorithm. Maybe it's not quite an algorithm, but a, a decision tree. And uh, most of it is pretty self-explanatory. I would just point out that probably points two and five, two being the, the, the disease causing gene and five being the delivery are probably the most important parts of this whole occasion. Uh, on, on number two, we are obviously, again, just to go back, we're looking for a gain of function and upregulation in genes. Anything where there's a downregulation or maybe even genes missing is not suitable to our technology. Then we have to go through the whole process of due diligence of whether the particular gene or the disease we're going after in terms of costs, uh, as opposed to the, to the current treatments of small molecules or antibodies, uh, efficacy and safety. And if we pass that hurdle, which, uh, which we, we, we usually do, we come to the point of delivery and whether we can actually deliver uh, the sRNA or, or, or the zip, which depending on how simplistic you want to be to the target cell. So I think we're getting to the, to the interesting parts of, of, of the kind of knowledge base of where I really began to sort of, if you like, get in the zone of really understanding what's going on here. And, and any, any drug development plan has to be able to deliver the, the, the cargo or the payload to the right area. So over there on the right hand side, you see that there's a nice bar chart of tissue distribution of sRNA and microRNAs, which we'll come to in a minute. So you're seeing quite a broad delivery to, to, to different um, organs and locations in the body. And Atuplex um, is the delivery system being used by our lead product, Atu027, again in a cancer and metastasis setting. So this is a good starting point to think we're actually delivering the cargo to the right place. 
And we're coming up to the two or three probably most important slides where we're back to our old friend, DNA, RNA, protein, and the central dogma. And this time, not on page one of, an, of a textbook, but actually in a, in a real life therapeutic setting in a, in a real company. So if we can just use our imagination a bit, uh, the, the gene has been transcribed to RNA, so the DNA has been taken out. Our target gene on the top left, I wish I could point at it, but I can't, says PKN3. That's our uh, gene of interest in our 2027, where we've hypothesized it plays a, a strong role in metastasis and in cancer and, and, and inhibiting this gene or taking the expression levels down are, are of particular interest to us. And so, you know, we have a, a series of nice experiments here and the, and, and the bar charts we can spend a little bit of time on. Uh, on the left bar chart, we have a, a simple case of a vehicle control. That's sugar being applied. Um, and, and obviously, if you see any of those bar charts going down when sugar is applied or even going up, you've got a problem on your hands. Sugar, sugar shouldn't be altering gene expression. And then on the right-hand side, on the x-axis, you see the, uh, an increase in dose, 0 0.03, 0 0.1, 0 0.31, and 3. And the higher the dose goes, you can see we're getting some very nice gene knockdown or real-life RNA interference and silen silencing as, as the dose increases. And to take that to the central dogma and take it slightly forward into the protein level, so we're looking for protein knockdown. Again, on the PKN3 line and the, and the control, you can see the protein is being very firmly produced. But as soon as drug is applied and, and, and the dosage increased, you can see there's a clear degradation of the protein. And, and so, as I said, this is real life RNA interference at work. And, and maybe a more important point, which doesn't, which doesn't come out strikingly in this slide, is we've got two control proteins, P110A and actin, at the bottom, and we can see that we're specifically targeting PKN3 and PKN3 only. So if you think back to our short interfering RNA and the zip matching with the other zip, we're being incredibly specific here in terms of targeting. So we're going in, and, and that's, I guess, why people think about sRNA technologies as a kind of laser-guided technology, going in there and targeting only what is targeting and leaving everything alone. So on the point of specificity, this is, I think, probably my favorite slide. It, it, this is our lung delivery. And we can see that the, the distribution of drug is heavily uh, weighted towards the, the lung and a little bit in the liver, which is quite normal. And to take that forward again into our famous gene silencing slide, again, the, the gene's been transcribed to RNA. So top left, the target gene is a gene called TIE2. When we go to the bar chart situation again, where the control is having no effect, that's obviously a very good start. And we really then are seeing at 0.3, 3, 3, 6, and 12, some very dramatic gene knockdown in TIE2. Um, and, and commensurately in the protein level of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the central dogma, you can see the controls are working very well and TIE2 is being reduced there. And back to my specificity point, that the control protein is, is, is being left obviously well alone. Okay, so I guess at this point we would have what's called a, a, a product really which uh, which is which is ready to go in for an IND or an investigational new drug and that's a if you like a presentation or a pack of data that we give to a regulator such as the FDA for for a clinical trial and this particular product call it ATU, whatever you want to call it, has will kind of tangibly li leave our preclinical department and go into Mike's department of the clinic and this is where we begin the the, the, the even more painful process of, of, of designing safety protocols in phase one, efficacy in phase two, and, and a randomized control trial in phase three, hopefully all the way to approval. And I guess if you take that one step forward, if you get the same sort of translation um, from one species to a, to a human being and starts to show clinical benefit, this is your point of, if you like, if you really want to be dramatic about it, blockbuster drug status. And I guess at this point, I want to just highlight the fact that as we stand currently, there are no approved siRNA drugs in the, uh, in, in the market whatsoever. So clearly, a, there's a race on to, to, be the, to be the first approved drug. And maybe the first approved drug is not the most important part, but uh, clearly, that's a, a, a major landmark for the first drug to actually hit the market. OK, and I think at this point, I went from feeling a lot better than when I first started this presentation. Um, and I didn't feel like such a fake CEO. And I really began to understand really the potential in this company. And, and it comes to one of my favorite slides where we basically talk about, I really began to understand the concept of a, of a, of a drug platform. And this is one of the best diagrams I've seen of a drug platform. And by that, I mean a, a very simple process, which is very repeatable. And we go round and round and, and, and kind of make the same process and the same drugs each time. Um, so 
I've unashamedly started with delivery as our most important part of our company. In some ways, delivery is still what this company is all about. And if I click here, we add our cargo or payload, and we've talked about our short interfering RNA or add to RNAi. Awful name if I, when I even say it now. Uh, but it t transpires there are other, if you like, silencing agents or dimming agents or, or th that we're also working on. And one of these is uh, such thing molecules as a microRNA. Uh, microRNAs are highly preserved, highly conserved endogenous gene regulators already in cells. And, and the recent research over the last five or six years has shown that virtually every disease in a diagnostic basis has either a deletion of microRNAs or an overexpression of microRNAs. And we've been in a position in the last year where we've been doing a lot of preclinical research in microRNAs. We're in a position to probably publish that data. And microRNAs are going to become a, a, a big part of the armory of this company against diseases. I thought long and hard about this particular cargo, uh, but it, it shows the, the real flexibility uh, of our delivery system. So if we go back to the central dogma DNA, uh, <coughs> RNA protein, there are uh, instances where Proteins are missing, if you like, or down-regulated, and, and our delivery system is capable, if necessary, of putting back messenger RNAs in order to be able to create proteins. So we add that to our scientific expertise and testing facilities and, and, and really global collaborations that we have. We have a whole host of academic institutions who constantly want to collaborate with us and use our delivery technologies to validate their data, and we have really our preclinical R&D engine at work here. And the net result of all these tools is, is, is something which can target the entire genome. It's something I've, I've touched on before, and this is a nice diagram of the 22,000 genes in the human genome. The light blue, which I think you can, it still comes across, is, is, is the addressable market, if you like, for the current drugs of small molecules and antibodies, and our, if you like, dimming agents and our set of tools can uh, address the entire human genome. And the human genome is obviously, since the Human Genome Project, which ended in the year 2000, 2002, uh, is under intense scrutiny from a diagnostic pers perspective, and this great diagram from the e economist really shows what's going on in the marketplace. There is a parabolic expansion in the number of human genomes being sequenced, and conversely, a complete collapse in the cost of DNA sequencing machines. And in this diagram, this is a thousand dollars, but I would actually estimate us even getting near a couple of hundred dollars. So we're getting in a scenario. I always, whenever I see this slide, where Companies like us with targeted therapeutics like sRNA, with the amount of information and, and, and data that's coming out in the human genome, <coughs> we're, we're a major beneficiary of that theme. And I always think of uh, something Mike used to say to me that, you know, one day you'll be going to your GP and, uh, you know, the sequencing machines will be there and the diagnostics will be better and you'll have these overexpressions or gain of functions in your genes and he will have a, almost a shelf full of sRNAs targeted against each individual gene and, you know, when I actually think about that, that doesn't seem that ridiculous or even that far away. Okay, so it's slightly more on the business side of things. This is a slide I presented to our investors and, and shareholders when we did a, a, the May capital raise. And uh, what I was trying to get across here is some of the, actually all of the stuff that we've talked about so far existed in silence pre this raise. Um, and, and we really were an old-fashioned biotech company applying technology to, to biology. And although we were in the clinic with ATU-027 at that time, a lot of the philosophy internally was grudging. We had a lot of consultants. And really, the, the level of expertise, I think it's fair to say, dropped dramatically um, post that preclinical stage that I talked about earlier. And so today, I, with the hires that we've made and the changes that we've made, I think we're much more what I would call a, a mini biopharma company. Is that actually even possible? But I, I'm, I'm trying to get across the point of view that we're, we're, we're not scared of clinical trials. We're not scared of taking our ideas all the way from literally the idiot's guide to biology all the way, if necessary, to phase two, phase three randomized control trials. And we will back our ideas depending on, on, on capital and, and the data that's presented at the time. Moving forward to the board and the scientific advisory board, a uh, key promise that I made shareholders and new shareholders in May, again for the capital raise, was we were, we were going to have a significant, if you like, upgrade of the board. I guess they got a bit worried when I walked in with that idiot's guide in my hand. Um, and as you can see, as of today, we had a, a comprehensive announcement with a whole, whole host of changes and experience that's been added. And we've got grey-haired people, dark-haired people. I'm the only one with dark hair. Actually, no, Mike's got dark hair. <laughs> I, just, I, was, I, forgot, I forgot about you. Um, 
We, uh, we have, you, uh, you know, a cross-section of experience. We have ex-CEOs, ex-MDs, ex-FDs, and a scientific advisory board, really, who's the who's who in their field of oncology or, or, or in the lung or, or, or in liver. So, kind of nearly concluding on my least favorite slide, when I actually look at it now, I don't actually like any of the phrases there, but we have the people, the technology, and the capital. This last phrase is a little bit dramatic, but uh, I've been asked quite a few times, so what will silence look like in a couple of years? What's the plan? What's the strategy? And, and, I, and I think we're un unashamedly simple, really, with the plan. It, there's nothing very clever going on here. We are a genuine platform company with a set of tools and IP which are uh, very rare, if you like, and we need to prove the, the value of that platform by making an approved drug. And we're also in a strange situation, I guess, in business where we want even our competitors to have an approved drug because that will have a material impact on the value of our platform. I wanted to finish on the pipeline. I'm not going to steal too much of Mike's thunder. I think he's got quite a lot to say on it. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, today we... we, we we did a, an agreement with the University of Birmingham, a very prestigious group in head and neck cancer, and obviously we're delighted to do that. And that's the type of relationships that I think our company wants to have and other people want to have with us, uh, in, in particular in, in our ATO 027 uh, oncology and metast uh, anti-metastatic hypothesis. Thank you.